Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange Podcast. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you raise the bar on your own excellence to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's podcast. This is Hugh Ballou for yet another great episode of the Nonprofit Exchange. And like always, we have a guest that's not like one we've ever had before. 340 episodes. Guess what? Something fresh for you. It's about how to become a top 1% communicator. And uh, Brendan is my guest. He's coming in from Montreal, Canada. And Brendan, you have a very complicated last name. So as you introduce yourself, tell people a little about your background and why you do this work and tell us how to say your last name, please. Absolutely, Hugh. Such a pleasure to be on the show. Thanks for having me. And the last name is pronounced Kumarasamy. So, so my story began in business school. I studied accounting, funny enough. I thought I was going to be a numbers guy my whole life, which is literally the opposite of what I do today. But during my time in business school, Hugh, I started doing these things called case competitions. Think of it like professional sports, but for nerds. So other guys my age were playing rugby, football, soccer, basketball. I wasn't one of those guys. I did presentations competitively, and that's how I learned how to speak. But then as I got older, Hugh, I started coaching all the other students on how to communicate so they could win competitions. And I accidentally developed a talent in coaching others on how to speak. And that's what led to the YouTube channel Master Talk because I felt, my goodness, nobody's sharing these tips for free on the internet. So I started posting videos, and here we are today. So we can find you on YouTube under Master Talk. Absolutely, because my name is too complicated to spell, like you said. So if I, if I if I called it my name, no one would ever find me on YouTube. So there's some famous celebrity, and I can't remember who it is, said the thing about communication is that people think it actually happened. So what's so elusive about communication? Yeah, absolutely, Hugh. You know, from, from my vantage point, the reason why communication is so elusive is because the way it's taught is extremely vague. So let me give you an analogy. Let's say we want to get better at fitness or weight loss. It's very easy to measure that goal and the steps to take sure could get complicated, but at the beginning, they're fairly simple. Eat the right things, ideally eat less calories let's forget about the soft drinks let's stay away from the candy bars and after a week we'll see results but that tangible way of measuring progress doesn't really exist in communication that's why i felt when i started the channel and when i started the business i felt that what the industry was lacking that i brought to the table was simplicity practicality and generosity so for me communication is like juggling 18 balls at the same time one of them is storytelling one of them is body language one of the facial expressions so for me it's more of a question of saying what are the three easiest balls to juggle and if we juggle those we'll build momentum in the skill set now we're talking to um, our audiences nonprofit leaders and clergy and it's essential because we're we're convincing people to join our board join our organization donate money it's really essential that we get the message across. So what are some ways that we get in the way of our message? Absolutely, Hugh. And just to double click on your point, which is so important, especially with this audience being nonprofit leaders and founders, our whole job is communication. Because if we master this, we genuinely make a massive difference in the world. If there's a CEO of a nonprofit listening to this that's raised a million dollars this year, and through communication, they can raise 10, imagine how much more impact they can create in the lives of the people they're impacting through their nonprofit. So it's very important work, especially for this audience. In terms of the tips, let's start with something easy. Ball number one, the random word exercise. Pick a word like light bulb, like home, like soap, like silver, random words, and create a 60 second presentation out of that word. This serves two main purposes here. The first one is it helps you deal with uncertainty. Let's face it, life is filled with it. We go to a special dinner with high net worth donors and they ask us random questions that we didn't really prepare for. There's another situation where you have to raise funding and we didn't really know the key audience because we were informed the day before that we had to do this. 
or the most common one that I see a lot with nonprofit founders and leaders. Hey, my company wants you to speak tomorrow to our executives. Can you come give us a session? Some of them might donate some money. So we're not, we need to be prepared for uncertainty. So if we can talk about avocado toast, we can talk about anything. And that's really the key. And the second piece is if you can make sense out of nonsense, you can make sense out of anything. And that's really the magic of this exercise. Do this a few times a day. Wow, wow. My co-host today is the uh, board chair of Cinevision Leadership Foundation, David Dunworth, who is quite a wordsmith himself. What I notice about you, uh, Brendan, you don't just talk you you connect with your eyes you pause you emphasize so the method that you use to communicate is multifaceted so talk about some other let's let's back up a minute there's three main takeaways you want people to have today let's review those so people that are taking notes can can write it down so what are the main three takeaways you want people to have today Absolutely, Hugh. And you really touched on an important piece, right, which goes back to that analogy. Because a lot of us will look at communicators who are great. To your point, the word elusive you use, which is a really powerful one, and we go, wow, Brene Brown is such a great speaker. Wow, Tony Robbins is so good when he gets on a stage. But we just leave it at that. Whereas when we go back to that analogy, hey, communication is like juggling 18 balls. All I'm doing, Hugh, is I'm just the result of somebody who's been able, and I'm not going to say I've mastered all of them. I have a long ways to go. I have a lot more to learn in my life. But it's about saying, how do we master as many balls as possible to, to get to that level of speaking? So that we just talked about ball number one. So practice that a few times a day. In a month, you'll be really good at thinking on your feet. Number two is the question drill, Hugh. We get asked questions all the time, especially for in the nonprofit world. Where does my money go to? How does this help people? What percentage of it goes to admin versus other expenses in the, in the organizations? Why does this nonprofit exist? We always get asked questions all the time. And a lot of us, unfortunately, are not ready for those questions. I'll give you a funny example with me. A few years ago, when I started guesting on podcast, I wasn't this slick. So I appreciate the kind words. I remember my first interview then when I was a kid, practically. And somebody asked me, Brendan, where does the fear of communication come from? And I looked at the guy, Hugh and David, and I said, uh, I don't know, man, Los Angeles, New York City. You tell me where the fear comes from. I have no clue. So how did I fix this? Every single day, Hugh. I ask your audience to spend five minutes answering one question that they think the world will ask them about the cause that they're trying to protect, the cause that they're trying to bring to the world. And if they answer just one question every single day for a year, Hugh, they'll have answered 365 questions about their nonprofit, and they'll be bulletproof in any fundraising meetings. Talk about... You know, we have this thing, we're passionate about it. And when somebody wants to know something, we tell them everything we know about it. Now, there's there's some value and brevity because people aren't going to pay attention so long. So how do you how do you right size the answer in terms of length? Absolutely, Hugh. So there's two parts to that. The first part, which is exercise number three that we'll just get out of the way really quick, is just send video messages to donors who are who are supporting you. It's a good way for you to stand out. I actually have this thing in my Google Calendar that tells me when it's a client's birthday. And I'll put a birthday hat on, on their birthday, and I'll send them a video message saying, hey, guess whose birthday it is today? It's yours. I hope you have a wonderful one. It improves the relationship with your donors, especially if your donor base is still small. Like if it's less than a few hundred people, you can definitely keep that high touch approach and really stand out from any other nonprofits. You can raise more capital and impact more lives. The second part goes speaks directly to your question, Hugh, around, okay, a lot of us, we're passionate about our startups or ideas or nonprofits, but people don't necessarily want to hear everything. That's why for me, communication is three, it's three parts. The first one is how do we get people to listen to our ideas? The second one is how do we get people to agree with them? 
And the third part is how do we get them to take action? And unfortunately, a lot of us don't think enough about the third piece. How do we get somebody to take action on our ideas? Just hearing the ideas aren't enough to your point, Hugh. That's why it's important to take our information, sit down our, our key donors, ask them questions. What's important to you? What is it about this charity that makes you say, wow, this is impressive? And only bring up those points on the main stage so that you get the results you want. David, what do you think? You know, we, we tell people stuff and then we never ask them to do anything. Um, so that's it. I mean, how many, David, how many times have we heard people talk about things, but they never ask for anything? Right. And, yeah. And the, the call to action is, is just critical, both on speaking when you're, when you're talking to an audience or an individual, or you're writing something. The call to action should be constant. And most times, at least in the nonprofit and clergy world, we don't see it anywhere near as much as we should. So your point is terrific. Thank you. So in, um, in um, Seth Godin's writings, he has uh, presenting to persuade. Now, a lot of times we're persuading people actually, like what we're talking about now, to actually do something. But sometimes, you know, we've done a lot of good work. And we need people to know the impact of our work. So there's different kinds of presentations, right? So understanding what's the purpose, you know, well, I guess knowing your audience, what's the purpose of what we're saying? And are we, do we really want them to do something? Or is this an informational piece? They're already donors. They're already board members. They're already volunteers. We want to affirm by saying, look at the good that you helped us create. So Talk for a minute about different kinds of presentations. Very, very well said, Hugh, and definitely a big fan of Seth Godin as well. I study his work religiously too. So, so for me, the key that you brought up really well is the content of the presentation and the delivery will vary based on the context. So I'll repeat that again. The content and the delivery of your presentation will vary substantially based on the context that you're presenting to. Let me pull out a few examples that you had brought up in, 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 your, in your share. The first one is when you're having a small intimate dinner with the top 10 to 15 high net worth donors that already know you, that already donate a ton of money, you're not screaming and yelling at that dinner and going, uh, let's change the world. Everyone else at the restaurant is going to say, what's going on here, right? You're, you're taking a more calmer approach. You're asking them how their family is doing. You're building a more intimate conversation and you're getting a lot more input. It's a lot more interactive. Let's say it's a small room with 10 people. You're going slide by slide and you're literally making it a workshop. Hey, what do you think about this slide? Do you have any questions, Ruth? And you're literally calling them out by name. So that intention is very different than, let's say, somebody asks you, Scott Harrison from Charity Water is a great example of this, where he speaks a lot, and I think he's the gold standard in the nonprofit world, so I, I follow his work a lot. So whenever he has to give a keynote in front of, let's say, 50,000 people, and if he does a really good job, he'll, he'll get 500 extra people donating to his charity, 1,000 extra people in an hour that's going to be a lot more inspiring. He's going to talk about the peeps, the troughs, the, the challenges in his life, and ultimately what led him to start the charity. But all of us can do that. Our origin story, why do we care about this? And at the end, we have a massive high energy CTA call to action to say, donate now. It'll change the world. You'll change people one step at a time. So the intention of both of those meetings is very different. But to keep it simple for your audience today, Hugh, the key is to master one of them at a time. And you wanna start with the presentation that you find yourself the most the giving the most often, which in the nonprofit world is definitely going to be the origin slash fundraising talk is the most common. So it's the one you need to perfect first. So let's, let's talk about technique a little bit. Um, as a keynote speaker, one of the coaches I hired was a drama professor. And, you know, the things we went over was, you know, you warm up your vocal cords and all of that. But you don't just start talking. You center yourself, you know, center stage or wherever you want to be. And then, you know, you don't pace. You don't stand behind the lectern and you look people in the face 
and you don't talk straight without a break. So there was some punctuation. So talk about some of the delivery techniques that are enhancements for the message. Absolutely, Hugh. And you had brought up a couple of them as well, very well from, from, from the coaches that you had hired in the past. You know, for me, what it comes down to, going back to that 18 ball analogy, right? There's so many different techniques that people can implement. But I would say the most important out of all of them that's easy to implement is called puzzle. So what is puzzle? Communication is like a jigsaw puzzle, Hugh. You know those 500,000 piece puzzles you used to do as kids and some of us still do, of course, to this day. They're super fun, especially during the pandemic when we didn't have anything to do. So now the question becomes, when we work on a jigsaw puzzle, which pieces do we start with first and why? And the answer for most of us is the edges because they're easier to find in the box. Pluck them out of the box, they got a little edge piece to them. Do the corners, then work your way into the middle. So why am I bringing this up here? I'm bringing this up because in communication and presentations, especially keynoting, we unfortunately do the opposite. We shove a bunch of slides, we put them all together, we get to the presentation, we ramble throughout the whole thing, and the last slide sounds something like this. Uh, yeah, so um, thanks, not the right approach. So instead, what you want to do is the next time you're preparing a presentation, practice it like a jigsaw puzzle. Start with the edges first. Do just the introduction, just the intro, 10 to 15 times. 10 to 15 times seems like a big number, but it isn't because your introduction is two minutes. So this will only take you 20 minutes. Same thing for the close. What's a great movie with a terrible ending? Last time I checked, terrible movie same thing with the conclusion and then tackle the middle and that's how you practice optimally for time love it the last presentation i heard i had a problem with the ending it was too far from the beginning so that you know the whole timing of the whole thing is so that's a those are wise words david i bet you got a question percolating here yeah you know uh i, I really find your your Delivery and your information, fascinating. I've been a speaker for many years. I've been an author. I've done all of those types of things. I've been in front of people a lot over the course of my career. And, you know, I, I've just learned something very, very new. A uh, couple of things out of what you're saying uh, make total sense. And to some people, that would make, that would be a common sense thing. Well, not everybody's common, and I'm certainly different. So, Thank you for the information. I really appreciate it. I hope the audience is really paying attention because you've got some great gems that you're dropping. It's great. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I spent a career as a music conductor with my back to the audience. So in 2007, I turned around and faced the audience. You know, at first it was scary, but speaking is a whole lot easier than conducting. But there's a lot of people that freeze up. So what advice do you have for people that are afraid of standing in front of others and sharing their message? Absolutely, Hugh. You know, my perspective has always been the goal should never be zero fear. I mean, think about my story. I started Master Talk when I was a kid here. I was 22 years old. I have a physical disability in my left arm. I spoke my whole life in a language I didn't even know, because in Montreal, as you know, since you've been to, since you've been to the city, for, especially at the time you, you went, you said 1967, if I remember correctly. So, yeah. so back then, I mean, French. French is pretty much the only spoken language there. So because of that, I had to study in French. And that's what my education is and why I'm fluent in it. But I had to present in French, but I didn't know the language. And on top of that, you would think a communication expert studied in communication. And I got a bachelor's degree in accounting. I'm literally the complete opposite of what you would expect a communication expert to be and to do. So why did I do it anyways? Why did I go up on those stages? Why did I decide to share my message for the 15-year-old girl who can't afford a communication coach. Yeah, sure, you know, I'm super fortunate today. I work with some incredible people and, and I do well for myself. But the reason I started Master Talk was for that girl because she doesn't have those resources. And how I bring this back to everyone else listening, Hugh, is the following. Every accomplishment in our life 
getting married, asking your wife out on a date, having children, applying for college, interviewing for a job, starting a business, everything that we're proud of in our life is attached to some fear. None of our accomplishments is attached to zero fear. But for some reason, when it comes to speaking, we go, oh, I'm scared, so I'm just not going to do it. So the challenge is not how do we get rid of the fear, but rather say, how do I create a motivation in our life that is so great that it trumps the fear? And the way we do it is through this question. How would your life change if you were an exceptional communicator? Or rather for this audience, how would the lives of the people you're raising money for in your nonprofit change if you overcame your fear of communication? And if you start to really reflect on that question, you'll take it 100 times more seriously. You talked a little earlier about um, practice. And the misquote is practice makes perfect, but it's really perfect practice makes perfect. And so I always thought it was a good idea to practice in front of a middle schooler because they're very impatient. But, you know, talk about some of the different ways, you know, to, if you run it in real time, you know how long it's going to take. And if you run it in front of somebody that will give you some feedback, you might some, get some good ideas of how it's really coming across. Talk about some of the effective ways that people, and it's essential to rehearse. So talk about some good, good ways that people can rehearse. Absolutely, Hugh. And I always like to keep things really simple. If you do what I say, the following, you'll have gotten the value out of this, out of today's conversation, because 99% of people won't do it, which is very simple. It's very easy to do, but I'm always surprised that most people don't, which is booking 15 minutes in your calendar every single day to do the three exercises we talked about. You know, a lot of people, Hugh, when they listen to me on a, on a show like this, on a podcast, they go, Hugh, David, you guys brought on a really interesting guy. Why well, he's teaching the random word exercise, the question drill, the video messages. All of this are so great. They take all of the notes. They go, wow, this is brilliant. I've never heard of this before. And then the next day comes and they don't do any of it. And that's where the fallacy lies. The best way to speak is to speak. And I'm not asking for 15 hours a week. I'm not asking for your whole day. I'm just asking for 15 minutes. Spend five of those minutes every day to do the random word exercise five times and make an excuse to do it. It could be with your kids. You could be in the shower. No one's doing anything in the shower every day and hopefully everyone showers every day. So you got five minutes there to do it. Or it could be walking a dog. Spend five minutes answering one question that a donor might ask you about the cause that you're raising money for. And do that every day. It just takes five minutes. And then the third thing is send three 20 second video messages to three donors that are supporting your cause. And the only rule to those video messages is you're not allowed to retake the video. You would be shocked, you, to know that very few people implement just that every single day for the next 30 days. And I encourage you to do that. And then the other piece of course is practice puzzle. Whenever you have a big presentation coming up, just spend 30 minutes and practice the introduction and get feedback just on the introduction. Don't even worry about the rest until people say, wow, David, wow, you, this is the best introduction I've ever heard from you. Then do the conclusion so you get the CTA right to make sure people actually give you money at the end so you raise more money for the charity. Then you work your way into the middle. Absolutely priceless advice. So I'm going to encourage people. You're listening to this. Do something every single day. If you just work five days a week, five days a week, 15 minutes would change your life. So, uh, Brendan, it's so folks, you're listening to the Nonprofit Exchange. You can find it at the T-H-E, nonprofitexchange.org, and you'll find all of our 340-something episodes. This one will be on the top. Um, and in this episode, you'll have a link to, to Brendan's website and to his YouTube channel. But Brendan, when they go to your website, what will people find there? Absolutely, Hugh. Such a pleasure to be on the show, you too. Thanks for having me. So yeah, the, the website, which is rockstarcommunicator.com, we run a free communication workshop every two weeks that I facilitate live over Zoom. And this is a great opportunity for anybody to see me actually apply these insights in a live workshop. It's okay if you're eight years old, if you're a billion dollar CEO, everyone's invited to this call. So if you want to come to it, just go to rockstarcommunicator.com to find out more. That is, hey, David, we got to go. We got to go. You know, I don't care. I'm 76. 
I learned today things I never knew before, and I consider myself a professional speaker. So, Brendan, you just popped out of nowhere. I don't know how you found us, but uh, I'm glad you did. And this has been a wonderful, wonderful interview. So thank you so much for being our guest today on the Nonprofit Exchange. The bravo, sir. Absolutely. Bravo. Great. Enjoyed it. Thank you so much. And Thanks, I think yeah. our audience is going to learn some pretty fantastic things today. And I really appreciate your being on the show. Thank you. Of course. The honor was mine. Thank you for watching the Nonprofit Exchange.